hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue talking about power supply parameters and focus on the output voltage accuracy under dynamic conditions. Now just because a power supply has a very good output value under stable static conditions does not mean that things will stay the same when something in the system changes. So if you're curious then keep watching. So what can we say are dynamic conditions? What can change? Well, to properly work, the power supply needs a specific input voltage and the load will be drawing a specific amount of output current. Both of these things can change. If the variation is slow, we sit in the static accuracy domain. However, if the variation is fast, we move to dynamic stability. So you have the topic of line regulation how well does the power supply react to a sudden change in input voltage? And then you have the topic of load regulation. How well does the power supply react to a sudden change in output current? Both of these changes will have an impact on the output voltage for a short amount of time until the power supply reverts to static conditions. And observing the shape and magnitude of these changes is important in making sure the supply works as expected. Just like with the static output, the reasons that problem can occur during transients is because of the feedback loop. So from the time a variation occurs, either on the output or on the input, until the circuit can do something about it, is a finite non-zero value. At the same time, the amount of variation for which the circuit can compensate is again somewhat limited. The common end result will be as follows. The output voltage will vary in direct proportion to the variation of the input voltage. So if there's a sudden rise in input voltage, there will be a rise in output voltage. And if there's a drop, well, there will be a drop in the output voltage. And if the output load is varied, so the output current changes, the output voltage will vary in inverse proportion. So for a rise in output current, there will be a drop in output voltage. In both these cases, there are two important aspects to observe. First off, the extreme voltage is obtained, so the peak-to-peak -peak variation in the output voltage under the specific transient. This is related to how fast the supply reacts and the severity of the change. And second is just how clean the recovery is. So in certain cases, other than an overshoot, also an undershoot can be observed. Or the stabilization could take a bit of time in which it oscillates. And in extreme cases, this oscillation will not stop, but rather get amplified and become potentially destructive. So ideally, you don't want to see something like this. Starting off with line regulation, this refers to applying changes in the supply voltage and observing the behavior at the output of the supply. So first off, you have the extreme cases of turning on and turning off. So large variations in the supply voltage, and these will occur in any system. And in some cases, these can be problematic, specifically on the rising edge of the input voltage, since this could cause an overshoot in the output voltage. One element that can help if this is an issue is the existence of an enable pin. So it should be possible to turn on the supply only after the input voltage reaches its final value by including an RC circuit to cause a delay until the input voltage stabilized. By implementing this, there should be no more output overshoot. Another feature which exists in some supplies is the existence of a soft start. So a built-in slow turn on circuit, which forces the output to only slowly increase during a turn on event, thus giving more time for the supply to react and at the same time draw smaller inrush currents. So if this soft start exists, you will probably not have any sort of output overshoots or input in rush currents. The other case is when the supply network can naturally have some variations. So in large supply grids like the mains power network or a motor vehicle's 12 or 24 volt network, large and sudden variations in the supply can occur when certain loads are connected or disconnected. For these cases, the supply needs to be able to keep its output within a certain range during the various transitions. Now, the exact transitions that can commonly occur 
are usually documented for their respective network in various standards. So you shouldn't test this thing. Now for today's measurements, I will be using a power supply built around the LM323. So it's a basic linear regulator and to make the various effects as visible as possible, I'm using the minimum output capacitance of only 100 nanofarads. Now specifically for the turn on and turn off test, I prepared this setup. So here the power supply is connected to the well, power supply through an electronic switch. So this is being driven by the signal generator which is behind just so we can get a clear on and off transition. And then the output is connected to the active load through an amp meter. So before starting the actual test, we can turn on the device and set the static current that we wish to test with. So 500 milliamps should do. Then we can connect the supply through the electronic switch and proceed to turn on the signal generator. So with the setup turned on, we can see in blue the supply voltage. So this is going between zero and about 10 volts. So it's five volt per division. And then in yellow, we see the output of the supply, which is about five volts. So it's two volts per division. Now, the things that we are actually interested in are the transition points. So if we zoom in to the turn on event, we can see the supply voltage rising. It's not a very steep slope, but that depends on your switch. But what is also important to observe is that the output of the linear regulator also has a clean transition. So there's no overshoot or any other oscillation. In a similar fashion, when we look at the turn off behavior, again, we see a clear falling slope on the supply voltage and then a clear falling slope on the output of the linear regulator. So for this particular test, the supply is doing quite well. Now, on the other hand, if you want to test a specific supply pulse, then the setup needs to be changed a bit. So to illustrate this, I prepared the setup again around the same power supply. I'm still measuring the input and output using low noise connections with the oscilloscope probe and I have the output load as before, but the supply this time is coming from a power amplifier. So your pulse of interest needs to be generated with some sort of signal generator, amplified through a power amplifier, and then this will supply your test supply. And first things first, you need to confirm that the pulse being applied on the supply is the correct one. So check the amplitude, minimum and maximum, as well as the slope. So for today's experiment, I prepared the 10 kilohertz pulse that goes between about seven and nine volts. And then the transitions have about 50 microseconds. So if we also start monitoring the output of the supply, well, we see it's a nice stable five volts. So at least at two volts per division, but to get a clearer picture, we can switch to AC coupling and then zoom in a bit. So at about 20 millivolts per division, we start to see something. So if we zoom into the rising pulse, we can see that for a short period of time while the rising edge is active, we have a bit of an overshoot, but it's only about 15 millivolts, so it shouldn't be of great concern. And in a similar fashion, if we look at the falling edge, again, we see that the output voltage falls at the same time. So we have a drop of about 20 something millivolts. Now the exact response of course will be dependent on the applied pulse characteristics, the power supply, and again it's highly important to mention that the tested pulses need to be something realistic. So there's no point in testing some random pulses. Only things that might actually be applied to your regulator under its normal use case. Moving on to load regulation, this refers to changes in the output load current. Depending on the type of load and the way it's connected to the supply, the current draw will be more or less consistent. So one extreme case is a perfectly resistive load connected directly to the output. Once there is voltage, there will be a current. The next is a switched load. So after the supply is activated, there's a time delay until the load is connected or the load is periodically connected. So for example, an LED with a specific duty cycle applied will fit the bill here. And then there's the combination of both of these. So both a constant amount of load coupled with a switch load superimposed on the first one. This will commonly occur in more complex circuits. Now the exact current steps 
and the constant current will be of course use case dependent and the extremes need to be checked. First, you need to observe the variation from zero current to some value and then under a specific constant load, the application of an extra amount of current. It's important to point out that the load step from say zero to one ampere will lead to a different output behavior than a load step from say one to two amperes because the power supply can be in different operating modes. So if these are both realistic use cases, both a zero to some value needs to be tested as well as a load step coupled with a static current. Now, testing this behavior will require some sort of electronic load. These can either be bought or they can be made. So as illustrated in this ROM article, a basic example of an active load can be built with a static load, so some sort of static current drawing element, and the dynamic part can be built with a transistor being driven by a signal generator connected in series with some extra load. Now, a more complex circuit can be found in this application note 1733 from Texas Instruments, in which a schematic is given for a electronic load, so where the load is being switched by a switching transistor, and the signal generator part is included into the circuit. So it's built with dual LM555s, and using the various adjustment elements, you can adjust the frequency, pulse width, and even the rise and fall times of the switch. So depending on your needs, a more complicated or simple circuit can be built. Now, in particular, the circuit that I will be using today for the various tests looks like this. So the static part is built with a constant current sink, which is getting a signal through a potentiometer from a voltage reference. So this circuit allows the setting of the constant current part. And then for the dynamic current part, I have a 50% duty cycle oscillator built around the TLC555C and with the potentiometer, I can set the frequency. So the duty cycle stays at 50%, it's just that the frequency can be adjusted. And this circuit is driving a transistor again, in the collector of which we have a set of resistors, and based on how these switches get connected, a certain value of resistance can be switched into and out of the circuit using the transistor. So using the two bits of the circuit, we have both the static current part and the dynamic current part. To highlight this test, I prepared the setup around the power supply that we were using earlier. So I have my power supply, and specifically for the load regulation test, the output is connected to the active load, and to monitor the current that is being pulled, the line is running through a current probe. So we can accurately measure the current levels and the transition times. And we are also monitoring the output voltage using a low noise oscilloscope connection, so with a twisted wire connected directly to the probe and the oscilloscope voltage channel is set into AC coupling mode. So we're not really interested in the average voltage value, but rather the dynamic deviations that occur during the transition. And then other than this, we're also monitoring the input voltage because this test should be carried out at multiple supply voltages. So at least the extremes and a typical supply. So when we turn on the supply, first thing to adjust and confirm is the current waveform. So we're interested in the high and low levels as well as the transition times. So the exact slope with which current goes from one level to the other. Another thing to observe when looking at the output voltage is that we need to allow the output voltage of the supply to stabilize before the next transition occurs. So the timing between the two transitions from low current to high current and from high current to low current should be timed so that the power supply has enough time to recover and stabilize. Finally, once the current profile is set up correctly, we can turn to the actual measurement. So right now there is no static current, we only have our dynamic current in action and we can see that there are specific deviations occurring on the output of the supply. So if we look at the rising edge of current, we can see that the output voltage, first of all, drops down and then it slowly recovers to the normal output value. So the recovery isn't instantaneous, there is a slight oscillation in it. And we have a minimum offset of about minus 30 millivolts and then a small overshoot of 12 millivolts. When we look at the current falling edge, 
we see a slightly larger waveform, so I change the voltage base to be 50 millivolts per division. When current drops, first of all, the output voltage rises, and then again oscillates until it stabilizes to a final value. Another thing we can observe is that when we start adding in a certain amount of static load, the response of the power supply changes. So this particular power supply has a different response when the current steps from zero to some value compared to when current steps from a fixed non-zero value to a higher value. And this is typical in most cases. The two transitions, zero to something and something to something even bigger, will usually be different, so they both need to be tested and observed. Variations, both in input supply voltage and output load, are quite common in most power supply use cases. So testing to observe the output response under such conditions is critical in ensuring a good design. Such tests won't just show the interval in which the output voltage can vary, but also if the feedback loop is sufficiently stable to not run the risk of unwanted oscillations in the output. Now, this is not a definitive test on supply stability, but it's an easy way to observe if there is an issue to be found. And with that said, hope you got some useful information after this. Leave a thumbs up comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe to be updated on my videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.